I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I think Ken Harding thinks tonight Charlie is off. On a, well, there's our vacation. I think we can enjoy a little more. He will. Um, the college basically is consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Second, our speaker will let speak. Then we'll have our questions and answers period. After that, we shall have our free for all for adults. <laughs> we also have, have two rules of the college. One is white gold at a time, and two is no personal tax. Oh, come on! If you have anything to say, we ask that you say it during the rebuttal period. Speaker is Josh Richards, grassroots coordinator of the Humane League. Since its founding in 2005, the Humane League's mission has been to save the lives of as many animals as possible and to reduce as much animal cruelty as we can. We want a world where all animals are treated with the same respect and compassion that we show our family dog or cat. We are working relentlessly to reduce animal suffering through grassroots education to change eating habits and corporate campaigns to reform farm animal treatment. Let's give a rousing round of applause to Josh Richards. Good evening, everybody. Um, if I am too quiet, feel free to let me know, but usually people tell me I'm too loud, so hopefully that's not a problem. Um, as Tim said, my name's Josh Richards. I work for an international charity called the Humane League, and the Humane League's mission is to end the abuse of animals raised for food, and so that's a topic that I'm going to discuss today. And specifically, what I'm going to touch on is why this issue is so important and if I can convince you of that the ways that we can work together to really help achieve this mission. Um, I want to give a thanks to Charlie who is not here today but I want to thank him for inviting me to come speak with you all. Um, I also want to thank Tim for um, setting all of this up and helping me out um, with this presentation and getting all that stuff put together. I really appreciate it. And also thanks for Heather for all her work helping us out tonight as well. Um, I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation. Um, my presentation isn't super long. It should be about 25 to 30 minutes, so that should leave plenty of time for us to have a discussion afterwards. I do want to note that there are a couple, there's two images in there that are slightly graphic. They're not like anything like over the top, but just wanted to warn people. Um, feel free to look away while those slides are up um, if that's anything that's helpful to you. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is why animal agriculture is such a key issue for us to work on. And the way I'm going to make the case for this is by touching on three criteria. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the scale of the problems that we face in animal agriculture. The next piece I'll talk about then is how neglected this problem is. And then finally, I'll talk about whether this is an issue where we can really make progress, whether this is a tractable issue. Some of you may be familiar with applying these three criteria to specific causes. Um, this is actually grown out of something called effective altruism, which is a method of identifying cause areas that we can have the biggest impact. So when we're deciding where should we dedicate our time and resources, these are three criteria that can help guide us in those decisions. So with that bit of introduction, I'll move on to talking a little bit about the scale of the problem that we face with animal agriculture. So, in terms of raw numbers, in the United States, a little bit more than 9 billion land animals are killed for food every year. Um, that's just in the United States. Now, the majority of these animals are going to be raised on what are colloquially known as factory farms. So, what characterizes something as a, a factory farm is a few things. So, one of the common things you'll see on so-called factory farms are um, cruel and intensive forms of confinement. So things like battery cages for laying hens, gestation crates for pigs, things like that. You'll also see some routine forms of, of mutilation that are used to dissuade the animals from part participating in certain types of behavior. So I'm talking about things like the clipping of chickens' beaks, 
or the docking of pigs' tails in order to um, stop them from engaging in certain types of behavior. But I think sort of the overall summary of what makes something factory farming is the treatment of animals as nothing more than raw materials. So it's a very sort of assembly line approach to animals. Um, I'll get into like a little more details of some of the things these animals face. But I just wanted to give like an overall sense of what factory farming in general is. So in terms of animals raised in the U.S., somewhere between 95 and 99 percent of those 9 billion plus land animals will be raised on factory farms. Globally, every day, there's 130 billion, roughly, animals living on factory farms every single day. So this, in terms of raw numbers, is really immense. And if we're thinking globally about all animals raised for food, 94% of those will come from the intensive practices of factory farming. So the numbers, in terms of scale, are huge. But the actual suffering that these animals go through is incredible and immense. And so when you combine those two facts, it's really something that should give us, I think, a lot of pause. To jump into a little bit of specific detail, um, of those 9 billion animals raised for food in the US, the vast majority of them, 88%, are chickens raised for meat. So I'll talk a little bit about the specific lives that chickens and raised for meat in the US live. Um, of course, there are other animals, cows, pigs, geese, and so forth, um, that uh, face their own specific nuanced cruelty within the factory farming system. But for the sake of time, I'll focus on chickens speci uh, specifically. So one of the main issues that chickens raised for meat face around the world is that they've been bred to grow so large so quickly that they suffer from a host of life-threatening and chronic illnesses. So one of the main issues that these birds face is that given their incredible growth rate, their skeleton struggles to keep up with this. And so they suffer from leg deformities that can go from chronic pain that just impairs their gait all the way to them being non-ambulatory, which means they can't even walk at all. And in these cases, they won't be able to reach drinking water and can potentially die of thirst. These chickens also suffer from organ failure. Um, for example, their lungs and their heart can't keep up with this incredible growth. This is something that's fairly remarkable considering how young these chickens are. So when they're slaughtered, they're only going to be seven weeks old out of a, a natural lifespan of roughly eight years or so. Um, so they're still just chicks when they're slaughtered and they're already suffering from organ failure at this extremely young age. In addition to these issues, they're also uh, kept in cramped sheds um, by the tens of thousands. So you'll have situations where they don't have space to really walk around, um, they don't have space to extend their wings, and things of that nature. They also aren't provided any real enrichments in their environment, um, including things like natural light or, or perches, and these are things that they need in order to sort of live out some of their natural behaviors that they're strongly inclined to do. And then at the end of their lives, the, the slaughter process currently used is what's known as live shackle slaughter. And the way this works is the chickens are grabbed by their legs by workers, um, and then they're placed into shackles. This is a fairly violent process because they really have to make sure that they're hooked into the shackles. And so this can result in broken legs and things of that nature. It's also not a particularly pleasant experience for the workers handling these live birds, which are panicking and, and flapping around. Once they're put into the shackle, they're drugged through a, a water bath that's been electrified. The purpose of this is to stun them um, for the slaughter to come afterwards. One of the issues that we see come up with this method is that in some cases, the water bath might be enough to immobilize them, but it actually doesn't render them unconscious. So they may be unable to move, but they can actually still feel and are still fully conscious afterwards. So after they go through the water bath, they'll go through an automatic knife that cuts their throat. And then the last part of the process will be that they'll be put into a tank of scalding water, which is to remove their, their feathers and other um, things of that nature. Now some percentage of these birds will make it through this process and get to the scalding tank 
fully conscious, and so will enter the boiling water in a fully conscious state. Um, so even if 1% of these birds experiences that in the United States, that's more than 90 million birds. And so I think that helps also give like some context to the general scale of this issue, that even if a low percentage is experiencing this horrific end to their life, that's still a massive amount of birds. Um, and then when you think globally, it's even more than that. Yeah? Uh, don't they go through the, the automatic night before? Okay, they'll be it's a water? Questions later. Sure, Questions. so we'll, um, if you hold on to that question, um, I'm happy to answer it during the Q&A period. Um, thank you. Then what farmers do about it? Uh, like, we'll get to that too. We'll, we'll, yeah. get, we'll, get, we'll get to it at the question and answer period, Donna. And so we'll, we'll talk, um, I'll, protocol. I, I will talk about the second half of the talk will be like the ways that our, our organization specifically works to address some of these issues. Um, and I think that might help answer some of those questions. But again, like if you hold on to those, I'm definitely happy to discuss that after I get through the presentation. So a couple of other quick things I want to touch on, but not dive into a ton of detail on that will give you a sense of like the scale of the problem. Um, our climate change, for one, is a major issue with animal agriculture. So animal agriculture is one of the primary drivers of climate change, uh, climate change because they contribute a significant percentage of greenhouse gases around the world. Animal agriculture is also a major contributor to both air and water pollution. And also the consumption of animal project, uh, products, especially processed animal products, has been linked to some health issues globally. Um, so for example, most animal products are fairly high in cholesterol, which can lead to um, coronary heart disease as one example. Again, I don't want to get into a ton of details on these specific topics because they're obviously very complex. Um, but I just wanted to give a fuller context of the scale of the problem. In my view, the suffering the animals face at such a wide scale is the most important issue when confronting animal agriculture. But I just wanted to note these things too because there's other issues um, that come up because of these practices. So now that we have a general sense of the scale of the problem, I want to talk a little bit about how neglected addressing this problem is. So in terms of uh, charitable giving in the United States, of the 3% of all charitable, charitable giving that goes to environmental groups and animal welfare groups, only 1% of that 3% goes towards working on farm animal issues specifically. And so to put that into further context, if we look at this graph here, you can see in terms of the number of animals used and killed in the United States every year, the vast majority of those are going to be farm animals. But then if we look on the, the right side of this graphic, if we look at the actual charitable donations made to groups working specifically on farm animal issues, the graph is basically inversed. So we see that most of the charitable giving in the animal space goes to shelters. Um, a significant amount goes to other causes. And this is not to say that those other issues are unimportant. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is that given the scale of the problem that we're facing with animal agriculture and the abuse of animals raised for food, I think we need to think carefully when we're getting engaged in issues or if we're making charitable donations to really think about how neglected an area is. Because if an area is extremely neglected and really large in scale, the work we do to fix that problem has way more impact. So if you donate a, a dollar to an animal shelter or a dollar to a group, that's working on farm animal issues, the impact is gonna be way more on the farm animal issues, just given the, the, the scale of the problem and the fact that it's so neglected as well. And so the last piece I wanna talk about here is whether this is a problem that we can solve. How tractable are, are making solutions to these problems? And I think the first thing I would note is that there is reputable, scientific research about ways that we can actually make concrete changes to our farming system that will have significant improvements um, for the welfare of animals caught up in that system. So there are solutions that can be implemented um, that will significantly reduce the suffering of these animals. So the question then becomes, how do we actually get these solutions implemented? 
And so the Humane League does a number of things to work towards getting these sort of solutions put in place. So one of the, the biggest things we do is work to hold corporations accountable. So ultimately, corporations control the lives of these animals um, throughout the world. And so if we work with corporations to implement welfare policies that address some of the worst abuses of these animals, the impact and the suffering reduction would be significant. So to give you one example, going back to the chickens raised for meat, what we do is we work with corporations through direct dialogue, through pressure campaigns, through working with the media, through engaging people on the ground to address those very issues that I discussed previously. So for example, with the issue of the breed growing so large so quickly, we work with corporations to switch to a, a healthier breed of chicken that doesn't face those same health problems. With regard to the amount of space that they're provided, we work with corporations to implement policies where the animals are given more space to be able to move around, to be able to extend their wings, things like that. We work with these companies to provide enrichments for the birds, so things like natural light, or litter, or purchase for them to use. And then we also work with them on implementing methods of slaughter that avoid some of those key issues that I noted before. Um, and I'm happy to go into more specific detail on those if people have questions um, during the Q&A section on that. So what we do is we work with corporations to implement these policies, which then will funnel down to the producers to actually start to make these changes. We also work to enact laws that protect farm animals. Um, so again, kind of going back to the chickens, they're the most exploited but least protected animals. They're actually exempt from some of the federal level legislation we have protecting farm animals, um, which in, of, in and of themselves are already fairly weak. Um, but if we're able to enact laws, that's another um, way for us to protect these animals at an institutional level. Um, and so working to enact these laws, deploying our grassroots network to um, support them is another key thing that we work on as well. And then we also work to empower individuals to make more compassionate food choices. Um, ultimately, as individuals, we're making a choice every meal we sit down to, whether or not to participate in this industry. Um, and so we work with people wherever they're at, if that's you know maybe just one less meal a week eating meat, or maybe just adding more vegetables to their diet. We work to empower people to be able to make those changes in their lives. Um, and so we have a website called eatingveg.org that helps provide guidance to people to be able to do that. And so with some of these methods, we've seen some pretty significant results from our work, though we are a long way away from ending the abuse of animals raised for food. So for example, to date, more than 400 companies in the US have committed to removing cages from their egg laying uh, supply chain. So this is a major shift in the industry that's been accomplished by working with corporations to implement those policies. More than 100 companies have agreed to our uh, ask with regard to the chickens raised for meat that I laid out just a few moments ago. And then in terms of legislation, tens of millions of animals are suffering less because of legislation that's been enacted in a number of states across the country. So most recently, there was a Proposition 12 in California that was passed, that was in this previous November, that actually built on banning some of the worst forms of confinement of animals. So that's battery cages for hens, veal crates for calves, and gestation crates for pigs. Um, but more importantly, this law actually made it illegal to sell products from those methods within the state of California. So to give you an example, if a farm in Iowa wants to sell eggs in California, they have to adopt a cage-free system um, within their supply chain. So this is a pretty significant legislative victory because California is a huge economy. It has a lot of intrastate imports. So these sort of legislative actions have a huge impact in reducing suffering of animals in the US. We've also worked to distribute a lot of um, um, veg eating guides to people across the country to give them the information they need to make um, more compassionate choices in their diet. And we've also um, had millions of people view undercover footage from these factory farms to sort of give people a view behind the yeah. curtain of what goes on on these farms. That's what I said. Another key aspect to what we do, and I think something that's really important in terms of
actually implementing these sorts of changes is to build coalitions and collaborate with other organizations. So as I noted previously, groups that are working specifically on farm animal issues um, only get a very like minute number, uh, a, a, name, a minute amount of the funding that goes towards the, these sorts of causes. So it's super important for organizations to be able to work together to implement these sort of policies and work with corporations and individuals to make these changes. So we started a group called the Open Wing Alliance, um, which is a coalition of organizations across the world that's working to end the abuse of chickens specifically. So there's more than 59 organizations that are part of this across six continents. Um, so we're able to make a lot of changes globally by having this sort of coalition. Um, the main league also works to distribute grants to these organizations to be able to enable them to make changes in their home countries. We also provide training and other resources to really be able to make them as effective as possible. In addition to this, we work with other organizations for specific campaigns we have in the United States. So currently we are um, in the middle of a campaign against McDonald's for them to update their chicken welfare standards to catch up with some of their competitors like Burger King and Subway to address some of those issues that I laid out before. So specifically the, the breed of chicken that they use, the amount of space that those chickens have, um, and the environmental enrichments for them. And so we work with a number of other animal protection organizations all listed here. Um, on a united ask of McDonald's to work to get them to implement this sort of policy. And so McDonald's controls the lives of something around 350 million chickens every year. So getting a company like McDonald's to adopt this sort of policy has a huge domino effect because they sort of control the temperature gauge of the industry because they control so much of that supply chain. And another thing I want to touch on that's extremely important is that we really focus on performing research through our, our wing called Humane League Labs to make sure that what we're doing is as effective as possible. Because ultimately, we aren't tied to any one specific strategy or tactic. What drives what we do is what we see as being most effective to ending the abuse of animals raised for food. And so all of these things I touched on um, and all the victories we've won certainly having gotten us to the point of ending the abuse of animals raised for food, but our view is that the first step to doing this is reducing this abuse, and so we've made significant progress in that front, and we're continuing to work to do more to achieve that. So, in terms of ways that we, as a group, that I can help, that you can help, um, if this was convincing to you as an important problem, is one is just, we have something called a fast action network, all of this stuff can be done on our website, humanely.org. But what this is, is it is something to allow people to do quick and easy actions from the comfort of their home, which helps us specifically in our corporate campaigning. Because ultimately, what corporations are sensitive to is the opinions of their consumers. And so the more consumers we have reaching out to these corporations, letting them know that the treatment of animals in their supply chain is unacceptable, the more progress we're going to be able to make in alleviating the suffering of these animals. Also, in Chicago specifically, we also have tons of volunteer opportunities. So if you or anyone you know is interested in this issue specifically and wants to get involved, you can always volunteer with us and help us out on that front. Um, attending our events is always something that's helpful. Um, we have an event page on our website that lets you know everything we have going on in Chicago. Um, but also, again, this just ties to really showing corporations that people care about this issue because ultimately that's what they're going to be receptive to. And then of course if you know anyone that's really interested in this or is this something that is really speaking to you, um, we have opportunities to work in our organization as well. And just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we do, this is an example of some of the type of protests that we'll hold. So this is outside of the McDonald's headquarters in the West Loop. Um, and really it's all about bringing together a community of people that are interested in this issue and that don't find that find this sort of abuse unacceptable and letting these corporations know that people won't stand for it. And so luckily uh, Chicago has been a great First Amendment um, a city for us. We've built great relationships with the police in Chicago and are able to really sort of make our voices heard, which I think is really um, a great thing and something that Chicagoans should be proud of. The last thing I'll note quickly is that 
If none of these things speak to you, making a donation to these sorts of charities is something that's highly impactful. Um, Humanely specifically has been rated as a top charity by a number of independent evaluators. Um, we're actually the only animal charity that has been rated as a top charity by animal charity evaluators for every rating period they've had. So we've proven in our actions and in the results that we've had to be an extremely effective organization. So I think that's another thing to always keep in mind as well. So as I wrap up um, this talk and we move into the Q&A section, I just want to kind of bring it back to the, the animals specifically, because ultimately this isn't about me or you or anyone else in this restaurant. It's about the suffering that these animals are forced to endure. And I think something that's important to keep in mind, and something that I think I want you to take away from this talk, isn't a feeling of, of guilt or shame or anything like that, but is a feeling of optimism. That if we work together and if we do our part, even if that is just making a slight reduction in the animal products that we consume, or just talking to other people about this issue, or donating to charities that are effective in this area, whatever part we have to play, if we come together and we do that, we can make significant progress in this area. And we're already reducing the abuse of animals raised for food, but ultimately if we work together and have these sorts of discussions and really hear each other, I do believe that ultimately we will be able to end the abuse of animals raised for food. Um, and so with that note, I would love to move into any questions that you all have. Okay. Do you need a moderator? Or do you, uh, I, don't want to get I think I can moderate. Okay, okay. No problem. All right. Um, I'll, I'll go to you since you had the first question. If uh, that's still a question um, for you. Um, oh well, uh, on Democracy Now! About a week ago, uh, Amy Goodman did a, se a, se a sequence of a group of people who went into a chicken uh, CAFO, I guess you call it, and um, they they chained themselves to that thing where they put the chicken's feet in there and run them around and somebody turned it on okay. while they were in there and one of the men who was chained in there came very close to getting badly badly hurt they did manage to get it turned off but he was you know he was pushed up again and what's your question well i just wanted to bring up the uh, sorry what, we can do that during the rebuttal period i am sorry to be uh, harping on this, but let's try to well, keep questions. I just think questions. you ought to, to watch that Democracy Now! sequence. It was very... We'll be more than happy to bring it up for you. And please, we I want to make sure that we keep it to questions. Uh, whatever you got, whatever you want to do. Sure. Yeah. I realize that these animals are not farm animals, but I was curious what the <coughs> position is. In Australia and New Zealand, as I'm sure you know, they are putting out poison sausage treats to eliminate their feral cat population. And I was wondering if your organization had a point of view on that. Okay. Sure. So, um, we didn't hear the question. Yeah, so the question is in Australia and some other areas in the world, there's a, a feral cat issues where they're actually putting out like poison in order to try and control those populations. There's a number of reasons that countries do this, but it's primarily because these feral cats essentially act as like an invasive species um, and actually kill lots of uh, natural wildlife. Um, so the Humane League, we focus exclusively on farm animals, so we don't have a specific position on that issue. Um, the reason we exclusively focus on farm animals is really just to be as effective as possible. Um, there are some other organizations that really work on all sorts of different animal issues, um, but for us, we try and stay really narrowly focused because it allows us to be most effective. I will note that some of the concerns in that area, so like, as I noted, feral cat populations uh, pose a significant threat to birds, specifically. So there are certain bird populations that have been absolutely like decimated by feral cat populations. So it is a tricky issue for sure. And I think, like in general, it's it's always about balancing sort of those outcomes. And I think it's you know it's a, it's a tough issue, but the Humane League doesn't have a specific position on that. Do you have a personal point of view on it? I do have a personal point of view where um, there are, we definitely need to take steps to control these feral cat populations given the impact that they're having on um, native wildlife. Um, I think a lot of these steps are of course just like spaying and neutering um, your pets to keep cats indoors wherever possible and really kind of like working on those issues specifically. Um, but yeah, it's a complicated issue. I don't know all the specific details on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something to be aware of and to be considerate of um, finding solutions for. Yeah, Tim. Okay. 
why did you get involved with this issue? What caused you to start really going in with the Humane League? And give us a little bit about your background, if you do not mind, please. Sure, of course. So Tim asked me to provide a little bit of my background and how I got involved with the Humane League. So in 2008, the Humane Society of the United States released some footage of what are known as, as downer cows um, being moved around by forklifts. Downer cows are cows that are non-ambulatory. So once they like reach slaughter stage, they're like even unable to walk into the kill chute, is what it's called. Um, and so when this footage was released, it's something that gained a lot of like national attention. It actually led to the biggest beef recall in US history, and the companies actually ended up having to be shut down that, that did it because of the financial impact of this. But it was also at the same time that the companion animal that I had grown up with also passed away. And so this sort of connection dawned on me that I loved and cared very much about this companion animal, this dog that I had grown up with. Um, but he had the same capacity to suffer, the same capacity to have happiness as these animals I saw on these factory farms going through these sort of unspeakable acts. And so that sort of is what got me thinking about these issues. Um, I ended up later in life working for um, higher education. So I worked at Northwestern University for a few years. I also worked at the University of Virginia for a couple years. But I got to a point where I really wanted to get more involved in these issues and really dedicate my time to trying to make change. And so that's when I made the move to start working for the Humane League um, because they are identified as such like a top charity and doing such great work in this area. And so I've been working with them for about 10 months now. Um, and so it's been great working in Chicago on this issue as it's been like a really key area for them, for sure. Okay. Next. Yeah, um, in the red cardigan. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, no, we know that. So listen, two questions. Um, are you a vegetarian? So the first question was, am I a vegetarian? Yeah, um, I so, can answer question. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm what's known as a vegan. So vegans don't eat or use any animal products as far as it is possible or practicable. Um, and so really the idea here is just to like exclude uh, the um, exploitation of animals to the furthest extent possible. And so I've been vegan since 2008. Besides charities to help animals, what really farm, farmers, they knew what's going on. How they can really, really physically help, and I don't know, financially charity, and maybe they even, they ask for charity. But how farmers helping to keep animals healthy and help them not to suffer? Yeah, so the question is how, what can farmers do to, to help these animals? Are they capacitation, like they getting together and meeting how to help? Can you explain? Sure, so um, farming is, is a difficult industry. Um, they have very slim margins. Um, so one of the issues that farmers face, specifically in the way um, the farming industry is kind of like laid out today, um, is that they're working around these like really, really thin margins. And so, in the 1920s, a quarter of the U.S. population worked in agriculture. Today, it's something like around 1%. So there's been like a massive industrialization of the process, also connected to these very thin margins. Um, so one of the big issues we see is that these huge corporations, so your, your Tysons, your Purdue's, um, these mega corporations that you know, really control the most of the supply chain, there's very few family farms that exist anymore, um, they use a method called vertical integration, which is basically like subcontracting out their farm work to individual farmers. And so what ends up happening here is these individual family farmers are on the hook for a massive amount of debt. They have to take out loans to have the, the farm space and things like that. Um, and then ultimately they're working to repay this and they have to hit certain milestones to be rated as top farmers to get the most sort of like bang for their buck. And so one of the issues that these farmers face is that these changes can be difficult for them to make because they can be fairly expensive to do that. Um, so I think what's really important to allow for family farmers to exist and for, uh, to allow for people to make these changes is for the consumer to become educated about this and being willing to learn that information and make more compassionate choices in the purchases they make. Um, but ultimately these things will cost more but we always have to understand sort of like what is the price we're willing to pay 
um, to alleviate such a massive amount of suffering. And in my opinion, we should be willing to pay more because the suffering that we're seeing is literally unprecedented in human history. We're talking about every year more animals being killed, or at least every couple years, depending on the specific count you use, more animals being killed in these terrible conditions than humans have ever existed. So the entire you know, 200,000 year uh, um, existence of humans, every single year we're killing more animals than that. And so I think when we think about that scale, we have to make certain changes, and ultimately it, it can be tough on the farmers, but finding ways to be able to do that, I think, is centrally important. Yeah, one more question. One more, very quick, if yeah. I may. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, OK, I guess government saw somehow pictures like you present. Sure. So what government do about it? Because government also, they using animals for food or whatever. Yes. So, so what those agencies do? How, how they help? Yeah, so the question is, what can government do to sort of like help these issues? Um, ultimately, there's virtually no political will to do anything at the federal level. Um, it's there's not a political. It's like really, you know, it's humane. Like you sure. Know. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree. But the reality of the matter is that there is no political will to pass federal legislation to protect animals. There are a couple laws that exist, but they're very, very weak, and they don't even cover chickens, which make up the vast majority of land animals killed. Um, so the, the approach that we've taken is to work in states that have ballot initiative processes. So states like Massachusetts and California, where basically you can gather signatures to get a ballot measure um, on the, for, up for election, um, up for a vote. And so that really puts the power in the hands of the people that live in the state. So in Massachusetts, banning the worst forms of com confinement passed by like 78% of the vote. Um, in California, it got like 63% of the vote. So the people want to see these changes, and farmers want to treat these animals better. And so um, that sort of like ballot initiative is the, the most successful route we've seen in terms of like enacting actual like legislation to help these animals. Um, and the best. Do, do you think it's humane the way uh, they kill uh, cattle? They, they put a device on, on, the, on the steer's head and and it, it hits the brain, and but they die immediately. I don't think they're suffering. Yeah, so the, the question is about um, no, cattle slaughter one. specifically. Um, so Somebody what like he was referring to is they use something called a captive bolt. And so what a captive bolt is, is it's basically a hydraulic gun, for lack of a better term, that will shoot out a bolt. And so the way that they, they stun and ultimately like render permanently unconscious cows, um, beef cattle, is they, they place the, the, the captive bolt to the cow's head and then they shoot it directly into their brain. So when this is done um, correctly, it does render them unconscious. The issue is, is that there are so many, the turnover rate in these um, slaughterhouses is so high, so in the cattle industry it's one cow every 12 seconds, is that it is impossible for the, the people responsible for utilizing the captive bolt to be able to do this with anywhere near 100% accuracy. The cows are thrashing around in the, um, the, the kill box. So one of the big issues we see with that is that it's um, required for them to stun the animals prior to their throat being slit. But one of the issues is with just the, the actual, like the rapidity of, of this industry is that it's very difficult to do this with any level of like significant accuracy. So what we see is that oftentimes it takes more than one shot to do this. Um, sometimes um, they just might not get it and it has to keep moving through the line because the worst thing that can happen in a slaughterhouse is them having to stop the line. So they'll basically do anything to avoid doing that. So while that is a step to try and make the process better, it's unfortunately not adequate to really alleviate the full suffering that occurs in the system. You're welcome. Yes, back there. Yeah, um, I'm getting to the question here. but. Uh, I used to work for Tyson as an advertising strategic planner. How does sure. Tyson advertise? And so, you know, on, I remember they brought us down there and showed us how humane they were, you know, like we're, we're stunning their brains and they won't feel anything. And at the time, I didn't think about, like, you know, what am I doing with this? I'm just trying to come up with a good tagline or, or something. But it's... It occurs to me, you know, now um, 
that what you're doing is so important and um, you know how can we more effectively persuade you know influence uh, you know it's advertised really for this kind of um, humane, humane things and I guess I just um, you know, I, one, I think targeting, you know, Tyson, it, they supply McDonald's, and so that boycott, divest, sanction kind of thing, and really name the names, okay. and, uh, you know, so you're doing that, but, uh, and it, just a concept, I don't know if you consider something like Alex does for conservative causes, you could do for, for these humane, human rights. Okay, what's your question? Rights. Well, I'm just, you know, what have been the most effective? I'm just, you know, you've, you've got some interesting numbers that I'd like to hear more about. Yeah. Uh, your effectiveness and sure. um, what, you know, how do you brainstorm for more effective? But, and also federal regulation. I wish we could, we used to have federal Again, regulation. Again, what's your question, please? Yes, I can, I can speak to the, I'm the question you of. To address these yeah, things. so of um, okay. the effectiveness piece. So we've, especially over the last decade, really seen that the most effective. Um, tactic in terms of like alleviating uh, the suffering is to work directly at the institutional level with corporations and um, government specifically. Um, and so one of the um, things that comes up a lot is like, so why don't we target specifically like Tyson, for example? So one of the reasons that we target um, restaurants like McDonald's rather than going directly to their supplier in Tyson is because McDonald's is much more susceptible to public pressure because they're a much more public facing brand. And ultimately we have discussions with the likes of, of Tyson and their response is always gonna be if our consumers, which is you know restaurants like McDonald's, aren't asking for this, why are we going to make those changes? And so we've had a lot of success working directly with corporations to make these commitments. And then what that does is that flows down to the production side, where in order to meet these commitments, the likes of Tyson and Purdue and you know these other major companies have to make these adjustments to, to meet that new demand. In terms of like making people aware for the, of this, um, it's, it's a difficult thing. It's you know these are heavy issues that not a lot of people want to necessarily confront. Um, we've all grown up, you know, eating animals, and I, I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm from a big farm state. My, on my um, mom's side of the family, they were farmers, like through and through, um, and so things have changed a lot since back then. Now it's mega corporations controlling um, the lives of these animals instead of um, individual family farmers, and so really working at the corporate level is something we've seen as being extremely effective. And then in hand with that, working with individuals to you know inform them about this and make more compassionate choices as well. Yeah, in the far back. Yes, uh, you were talking about all the, the new regulations to increase the size of cages. Yep. As you do that, you're going to increase the amount that that people are going to pay for you, your chickens, your eggs, and it will dis it will affect. The poor, the marginal more, they're going to be paying much more for their food. Yeah, so the question is about the, the price increase that we potentially see with these changes. So, um, now these changes are being made now, so we don't have a lot of direct data about what to expect. There's been some research done, so Purdue University did a, a pretty um, big research project on what our chickens raised for meat, or broiler chicken ask, would entail. Um, and the results of that study were, would be that the, the cost increase would be fairly insignificant. Um, we haven't seen major cost increase due to our cage-free campaigns as well. But of course it's an important issue to keep in mind that you know any cost increase in the food industry is going to affect poorer communities more. Um, but kind of going back to what I was saying before is ultimately um, throughout our history we've had to make some choices about you know things we needed to do in order to make things more ethical. So it's for like an easy example is child labor laws. So child labor certainly um, uh, impacted poorer communities, outlawing child labor impacted poorer communities than wealthier communities. But I think we would probably all agree that that's something, that's a price that we're willing to pay. And so I think a big thing that we need to consider is like, what, what's the price that we're willing to pay for this animal suffering? Um, and in my view, um, Given the relatively small increase we'd expect to see, I think these changes are worth it. But we always need to keep in mind the communities that will be affected. 
and work to um, help them as well. And then one other quick note I would make is that in factory farming specifically, the most exploited communities are these poorer communities. Refugee communities, immigrant communities, they're the ones that are forced to work in slaughterhouses, which is terrible work. It's, it's, it's horrible for them psychologically. It's, you, they have PTSD when they get out of it. And the communities that these companies are exploiting are these immigrant and refugee communities. And so the industry as a whole affects these poor communities in really significant ways. In addition, the, the pollution I noted before and climate change, which I noted, those are also going to affect the poor communities far more. So I think it's definitely something we have to keep in mind because it's so important. But I would argue that these sorts of changes um, are something that are necessary in order to really sort of like reduce this sort of significant suffering. So, yeah. if parents raise their kids to have a choice between animal-free diets and animal source of food diets, what are the noticeable differences between children who eat <coughs> animal diets and children who eat animal source food diets? How does it impact their development in their lives? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, what differences do we see on children raised on plant-based diets versus um, diets that include animal products? Um, it's, it's a really complicated issue to answer in general because there's tons of variety um, within those two camps. So for example, like uh, if you feed your kids nothing but Oreos, technically that would be a, a plant-based diet, but their health outcomes would not be great. Um, likewise, if you, you know, fed your kids nothing but chicken nuggets, that would have really significant um, health impacts on the negative side. Um, we're starting to see like, more information about this. Nutrition science in general is really in its like, nascent stages. Um, but all the major uh, dietary associations in the U.S. and Canada and other places have said that a, um, a, a planned vegan, plant-based diet is um, helpful at any age of development. So whether you're 100 years old or one year old, that it's a, a completely healthy and complete diet. Um, so it's hard to compare like sort of one versus the other because there's so much variation in, in it. Um, in terms of animal-based diets, the research is fairly clear that really head, like the sort of like standard American diet is quite unhealthy. Um, it involves a lot of red meat, a lot of processed meat, and there's been um, pretty clear connections uh, tying that sort of meat consumption with colorectal cancers, with heart disease, things like that. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue because like the spectrum of like a, a, a diet that includes animal products is like huge. Um, so I hope that gives like a little bit of like kind of like context to that, but I don't think I could give like a really clear answer to that given the, all the variables involved. Thank you. Um, yeah. Tim. I would just like to know, is your organization fundamentally against the raising of farm of, of farm animals for food, or are you just more into the reform of corporate practices to produce healthier, <clears throat> more uh, tasty animals, is what I would call. Yes. And then also, what are some of the things you do for the working conditions of workers who work around this stuff? I mean, certainly, you know, if you're seeing all these unhealthy chickens, it's probably going to affect the human health too as well. Yeah, so the, the question is connected to whether our organization is against the use of animals entirely or whether we're just focused on these reforms. So the Humane League is an, a, a very pragmatic organization. So our goal is to end the abuse of animals raised for food. And so that m would mean the end of exploiting animals in their entirety. Um, so not So there's really no strictly humane way to slaughter an animal. Um, but our focus is, is super pragmatic. So if we, you know, we view the case, like if we want to end the abuse of animals raised for food, that's going to start now with these sort of reforms and really reducing that abuse um, and ultimately building off that. It's certainly like a long-term goal to fully end the abuse in its entirety. Um, and then in terms of, what was your second question, Tim? The second question is, with the abuse of animals, and some of the requisite <coughs> conditions that the workers of these animals have, what's your stance and are you working to also improve those conditions of our homo sapiens that may be abused too? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the second question is related to the, the working conditions for people that have to work on factory farms and in slaughterhouses. It's definitely something we advocate for um, in terms of something that needs significant improvement. 
Um, some of our specific asks of corporations would have impacts on workers. So one of the big issues we see is that because these birds are, so for chickens um, specifically, because they're in such cramped conditions and there's so many of them, and because of their leg deformities that make it so they can't really move around very much, what ends up happening is that you have like a huge buildup of ammonia. And so for the birds, that ends up actually like giving them chemical burns on their legs and through their skin. Um, but for the workers, this also creates an environment that's just super ammonia rich and extremely detrimental to work in. Um, not to mention, when I was talking about the, the slaughterhouses before, that it's just really a difficult place to work and it's almost exclusively these exploited communities that are made to work in those conditions. Um, so we certainly advocate on behalf of those workers in improving those conditions. Our specific campaigns are focused on the animals, um, but there are other organizations that, too that um, uh, focus on some of those issues and give outlets to those workers. Um, and I think ultimately like a lot of this, too, is um, finding ways to, to train them and get them you know, engaged in other work that isn't so exploitative of them. In the uh, orange vest back there. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you familiar with uh, the writings of Peter Singer of Princeton? Yes, absolutely. His book, Animal Liberation. I, I was wondering what you thought his most important contribution in that book is. Yes. That's a great question. So the question is, um, what was Peter Singer's greatest contribution um, from his book, Animal Liberation? Uh, so those of you not familiar, Peter Singer is an Australian philosopher. Um, he's been at Princeton for many years. Um, and he wrote a book in the 70s called Animal Liberation that actually really kicked off the modern animal rights movement. Um, his most significant contribution is generally thought to be raising this idea of speciesism. So an analogy that Peter Singer raises in Animal Liberation is that our consideration of the interests of animals um, should not, we shouldn't exclude that consideration just on the basis of species membership. So just because a chicken isn't a homo sapien does not give us a reason to ignore their interests. And so the analogy Peter Singer drew is that this sort of treatment is much akin to um, like racism, for example. Um, and so his contribution of this concept of speciesism has been incredibly important throughout the movement since the 70s. Um, so I would say that that's probably his most significant contribution. But he's also been involved since then um, in advocating for these causes. So even just having his like voice as a, a high-level academic is extremely powerful as well. Yes? Well, well, uh, well uh, aren't most animals in the wild eaten alive? The other thing is I'm particularly bothered by these rogue male lions who want to take over a pride and they go to the female lion and kill her cubs. Do you regard that as cruelty or a state of nature? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is regarding wild animal suffering and some of the behaviors we see in wild animals. For example, a lion eating the cubs of uh, another like uh, lion in its pride. So the first thing I would say is that in terms of like how um, impactful like the work we do is, if we look at just like the, the biomass of the earth, how, many, uh, how much of it is made up of wild animals or just farmed animals, farmed animals make up by far the biggest majority of the overall biomass. Um, but I do think the issue of wild animal suffering is something that um, does need to be worked on. I think a lot of the things that are like the typical focus are like natural disasters and things like that and working on ways to sort of protect them from that. Um, it's a, an issue that's in its very early stages of people thinking about that. There are some organizations that work specifically on um, wild animal suffering, but I would not view a lion eating cubs as an issue of cruelty. It certainly is a state of nature um, because the, the, different, the primary difference being is that um, a lion isn't going to make considered judgments based on its moral beliefs. It's going to be driven by instincts and the various other factors that contribute to that. So it isn't something that I would view as cruel or, or morally wrong, but I do think that as a, uh, a species that has some limited ability to um, make changes and um, reduce suffering in the wild, um, that we should consider interventions that we can do to help alleviate some of that suffering. Yes? Have you, has your organization been monitoring the 
dispute involving Bear Oak Dairy? Yeah, so um, the, the question is whether we've been monitoring this, the dispute with Fair Oaks Farms. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this, but Fair Oaks Farm is uh, one of the largest, actually it might be the largest uh, dairy company in the U.S. They have a milk brand, or their headquarters is actually in Chicago, um, called Fairlife. Um, and recently um, a group um, released some undercover footage from those farms showing some pretty significant abuse of the dairy cows. Um, and so this has created a lot of, of pushback. So it's definitely something that we are monitoring um, and something that we are passing information along. Um, it doesn't connect uh, specifically to most of our campaigns because we focus so much on chicken welfare, just given the scale. Uh, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Um, and we work with a lot of the groups that sort of like develop some of that footage. Um, and so our primary work with that is helping to distribute that sort of footage. Uh, to consumers so that they're informed about those sort of practices. Okay, we got. Yeah. What about these free range animals here? About this? is that um, to get approved it for uh, animals' uh, safety? Yeah. So the question is about um, free range animals. It's so it's it's a difficult issue because there aren't legal definitions of many of these terms. So a lot of them are really just kind of like marketing terms. Um, so for example, free range eggs. Um, doesn't have any legal definition, so they're in the U.S. So you can see something labeled as free, free range, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the conditions are significantly better. Um, free range for chickens raised for meat just means they have some amount of time outside, no specific amount, so it could be you know, like a millisecond outside would technically meet that definition. Um, so I think really, in terms of those sort of like labels, Truly the only way, I think, to make a fully informed choice is to find farms that will actually let you go there and see the conditions specifically. Um, there certainly are farms that will allow you to do that in like the Illinois area. There's uh, a group called Prey Free Illinois that can provide some of that information. There's another group called Farm Forward. But ultimately what I advise people to do is if, if you're concerned about these issues and you don't want to participate, really, the best choice you have is to be able to find a farmer that will let you look at those conditions and really make that decision for yourself when you see sort of what goes on, whether that's something um, you're okay with participating in. Um, but certainly that connects to our corporate campaigns and some of the improvements we ask for, that those sort of things do significantly reduce the suffering of these animals. Though it doesn't eliminate it, of course. Yeah. I'm also bothered by these deer hunters who shoot these deers from 300 yards away and it's supposed to be a sport. The deer doesn't even know, know it's coming. Yeah, I mean, it's, so the question is about like deer hunting. And so, like I said, we work on farm animals specifically, but um, it's an interesting thing because like, uh, a lot of the reasoning behind deer hunting is for population control. But a, a big reason why deer populations are out of control is because of um, the extinction or the reduction of their natural predators. And a big part of that is actually due to farming. So as farms have like eliminated like native coyote populations, for example, that's allowed species like deer to really proliferate at an amazing rate. Um, and that's created the necessity to find ways to control those populations. Um, but I agree with you in terms of the, the sporting aspect of it. It's definitely not something that I can understand or come to grips with. Um, but overall, it does make a, it's not a huge portion of the um, animal killing that we see. Um, but I agree that there's, you know, improvements that can definitely be made in that issue as well. Um, do we have more questions or? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I uh, eat out a lot, so I eat breakfast out a lot. So I eat a lot of scrambled eggs and omelets. Uh, do you got a suggestion for uh, an alternative? Yeah, so there, there, I mean, there, there's certainly some alternatives um, depending on the, like, so eggs are a little bit tricky thing in terms of like eating out. Um, some places will have like tofu as a replacement for eggs, which actually works quite well. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, so you'll see something like, like a tofu scramble, which for me, I actually can't even tell the difference, even though it's, uh, it's been a while. Um, but also, I would also just like keep in mind in terms of that is to just like look into like where they, they source their, their eggs from. So if it's not something where you can maybe make the full change of switching to an alternative like tofu scrambles or other breakfast items, to so really just do what you can to look into where those eggs come from. 
um, to get to get a sense of whether um, it's the sort of like worst of the worst or something that's slightly Thank you. better. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other uh, questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker. We have plenty of time for rebuttals. We'll go about six minutes each with a soft timer. So, oh, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, of course. No, rebuttal. Okay. No, just raise your hands if you want to rebut. We'll just have an open mic and uh, we'll uh, move forward. So, I know you're chomping at the bit, so you got six minutes. So please go ahead. Night's a good night to be clear, coherent, and make your point. Hi, um, I already talked about uh, democracy now, and the can you hold um, on while I move that laptop in front of your in front of you so we can see you a little better, please. Let me let me get that out of your way. Okay. All right, and uh, uh, so you can go to democracynow.org, and uh, you can click around until you find that episode where the uh, activists. <laughs> moved in on a factory farm and um, they were very, very brave. Oops, it went off. Oh. They were very brave and um, they chained themselves to the contraption that runs the chickens around. Uh, I guess to have their throats slit. Um, so that was a really interesting episode. I saw a movie called The Biggest Little Farm. And I also went to the Bioneers Conference two years ago, and um, there was a far, the biggest little farm, the, the only thing I think that really applies to tonight's discussion is that a farm does not function well without animals. And if you're going to have a um, well-functioning, diversified farm, animals have to be part of it, and those animals will be slaughtered and used for food as people come to buy, you know, to keep your farm solvent. Uh, and I went to the Bioneers Conference two years ago, and there was a farmer there that uh, made the same point. They had a farm in California. Well, the biggest little farm was in Southern California, was in Southern California too. And, um, uh, but the one at the Bioneers Conference was a very nice farm, and they ran animals out on their fields, and um, it, the animals were necessary to make the farm work. Uh, so um, I agree that we might stop eating animals, except rarely, uh, because even even ancient man had meat once in a while. Um, and then I want to talk about um, <sighs> vegetarian abuses. Um, I, I, I bought some cookies at Aldi and uh, looked on the label and found that these cookies were using um, palm oil. So I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to buy cookies at Aldi anymore. I'm going to buy my cookies at Whole Foods because obviously they've got to be better. So the next time I bought cookies, I paid more, and I went to Whole Foods, and I took the cookies home and looked on the label, and they were using palm oil. So I wrote a letter. I didn't write a letter to Aldi, but I did write a letter to Whole Foods because palm oil is a product that is bad for the environment, it is run by people who are, uh, you know, if you want to talk to me about this, I could. But the person who brings these stories back is Vicki Cervantes. She goes to Honduras, she goes to Guatemala, and um, she knows people who have been gunned down near their own homes uh, on the way to work because they object to letting corporations take over their farms and plant um, African palm for the palm oil. And this is not animal suffering, this is murder of human beings. So um, uh, animal suffering is not confined. I mean, suffering because of food is not confined to animals. Human beings are exploited and uh, killed to provide certain ingredients like palm oil for vegetarian um, dishes and, and uh, 
pictures. So, um, that's probably about what I wanted to say. I hope you'll go see The Biggest Little Farm. It was really a lot of fun. And, um, so, it was a propaganda film. It was a documentary, but it, it was propaganda, you know, that it couldn't have been as much fun as it seemed to be for the audience, because running a farm is not that easy. But, um, oh, and the farmers in Southern California, when the buyers came, they were missed. The fire missed them, strangely. But that was, no, that was a spoiler, sorry. Okay. Next. Yeah, I just want to point out the source of all these problems. We did mention is that the worst animal on the planet is mankind, and we just have an overpopulation of people in the world. We are the ones that contribute to all these problems. Would it be uh, the abuse of our anim farm animals, pollution, uh, the, the uh, pollution of the ocean, and killing over killing the fish. We have we have we do not address this overpopulation. We have seven and a half billion people right now, approximately. I think we're growing something like. A billion people. I think. I think it's by every ten years. I mean, there's no. There hasn't been any kind of uh, discussion of this anymore. There doesn't be any control of population stability. I think United Nations and all responsible countries in the world should take this first, one of the first priorities. Try to handle, understand, the, cut the population, deal with this over, this uh, uh, aging population, which is a problem. Try to find new solutions to these. And unemployment, be like this, but cut the population down. We're the cause of all this like mass migrations all over, and the country that gets run over by other people. There's, there's no room for anybody. It's just, nobody's here. And that's the source of all this problem. Okay, next. All right. Just leave the plate in the back. Although I applaud the goals of the Humane Society and the, I mean, the Humane League, I do support a healthy animal. I do support healthy working conditions because it's in the best interests of us to have those conditions. But I cannot see the banning of farm animals or farm things because it's something that we've gone into. Here's the point. A lot, industrialization has made our lives much better. Now I understand that uh, what's happened is that the humanity has gone out of the almighty dollar. They are willing to sell us substandard food that's mechanized at a cheaper price. And yet, at the same time, we get unhealthy. I do know that I've had a free-range chicken before that was fried, and it is actually pretty good. Um, there was a noticeable difference between what was store-bought at Tyson versus a humanely raised chicken. Now, again, I would prefer maybe that market forces would say that it's better and sometimes it might take regulation to do so, but you would really think that it would be in the best interests of our major corporations to not just concentrate on the almighty dollar, but on the treatment of animals and its employees and its friends in there. Let's put it this way, the corporate, the family farm, as you've seen it, is still around and it's around in a lot of developing countries. And the increased mechanization with us, you know, we're able to feed ourselves on less than 1% of, of labor making it to it. And, and a lot of times that can be real progress. I just, you know, with climate change and everything else, there are real solutions out there to problems. You know, and a lot of people say, oh, let's get off fossil fuels, you know. Let's... Uh, ban nuclear power and things. And I say, well, what kind of nuclear? Is it the one we're using now or some of the newer prototypes? I have talked a lot about this previously, but I guess what I have to say is it's a balance question. I like my meat. I like my steak. I like my potatoes. You know, but yet I also know, too, a friend of mine who worked on a potato farm in Iowa, and he really said the job didn't, wasn't good, but he said it was a good-paying job, and 
we had our potatoes. And he also said, too, that, you know, he wished you got to learn how to eat a potato and all of its variations. He said it could really make for a good, healthy diet over time. Now, I don't know about you, but the other vegetable I really had, the difference between cultivated and wild asparagus. My father owned a lumber yard for many years, and we used to have wild asparagus up on the railroad tracks. And you could really tell the difference in taste between the wild variety and the, you know, cultivated variety. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's in there, but there is a difference between, you know, factory-raised foods and those that are natural. But again, you know, I don't know if the whole world can go into natural foods. Now, our last gentleman said about reduction of population. Well, you know what is happening now in a lot of ways. You get into a developed country, when a kid becomes a source of, when a kid becomes not a source of labor to help you retire, but an expense, that's when it's really, that's when you'll see population control coming in. For example, in the United States, it takes about a quarter to a half billion dollars to raise a kid. And that they're not fully functional a lot of times, they're in their 30s now before they do it. We know we're not going to stop having kids, but we're not going to have four or five because of the big rates. We know that when we have a child, it's going to usually be raised, it's going to live to a ripe old age, and usually one or two that most people have are usually the best things. And I, I, today, with an industrial society, it takes a lot longer to get established in life. And that too reduces the population. You'll see that, according to the CIA, once a country starts making above $8,000 per capita income, there is a result of drastic population loss, but it's at the expense of industrialization. And in a lot of cases, when man kind of separates himself from the environment, the environment usually wins, but you have to have money to do that. You know, if you want to get off fossil fuels, the best way is to get central power and electric power out to some of these rural areas where they're not burning cow dung anymore. And to me, the best thing that can happen to this world is a lot more globalization, a lot more trade, a lot more um, getting along together and stopping this constant drumbeat of war. Anyway, I've said my piece. Let's get some more uh, people up here to rebut. First of all, with regard to what I spoke of earlier concerning the business of cats. Cats are often made a scapegoat for uh, environmental problems. And I feel the Australians and New Zealanders are being unfair in their treatment of cats and in their attempts to poison them. And indeed, I noticed one fellow on the internet who went so far as to say that cats are evil. Cats always get the worst of it, cartoons and everything else. And I once would have liked to have visited Australia and New Zealand. Not anymore, not if they're going to murder all these cats. So the answer is they need to find another solution. I agree that pet owners are irresponsible. I had two cats at different times. One had claws, one came up to me already declawed, but neither one of them was allowed to roam around outside the house, period, end of story. They were welcome to whatever pests they could catch inside the house, but on that, they got their cat food, water, and kitty treats, and that was it. Um, I agree with much of what you said. Now, I eat meat, as I'm sure you saw over there. This isn't going to be changed. But I have stopped eating veal, and I have stopped eating pot to the extent that I ever did eat pate de foie gras. Because these animals don't just get slaughtered, they go through a whole long ordeal first. And that was true even before the present casual attitude toward uh, the slaughter animals uh, developed. And there's certain things that I draw the line at. So that's number one. Number two, uh, you spoke of the work of, uh, work of actually slaughtering animals being dehumanizing. My great uncle came to this country over about 100 years ago at a time when Chicago was still the hog picture of the world. And he worked at Swift and Company, 
where his first, the first job he got after he got to Chicago was plucking chickens. And you can perhaps understand why as soon as he had a chance to get a job as an executive with an amalgamated bank, which at that time was a small labor union bank, why he took it and went on from there to go on to night law school, get his law degree and become a lawyer. Uh, which is what he was when I knew him. And finally, in the late 1940s, when my father was about 27 years old, there was a peculiar practice that I don't fully understand myself that went on among young Jewish men. I guess they were thumbing their nose at the kosher laws. I guess so. I don't know. And he and a friend of his from McKinney, no, he and a cousin of his from New York, went through Swift and Company on a tour, and they saw the whole thing with the slaughter of the hogs from, 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 from beginning to end. And when I asked my father, well, I bet you didn't eat pork for a while, Dad said, no, we went into a cafeteria. We went into the company cafeteria, and we had ham sandwiches for lunch. It's apparently part of the same ritual as well. I grew up in a different area than he did as a baby boomer. We were really taught to, we should disagree with the kosher laws if that's what we wanted to do. We should respect them. I have no, even if the company has still been an operating entity in Chicago, I have uh, no interest in going to see the process done. Period. End of story. Now, I found your talk very informative. As I said, I didn't agree with all that I plan to continue to with me. But I see no reason why animals should be put through any more misery than is absolutely necessary. And when I was younger, it seemed like they weren't put through as much as they are now. I think some of that is due to the fact, and the conservatives in the room may not like this, is due to the fact that starting in the 80s, the government forgot to how to regulate how to regulate anything, not just not just animal rights and animal and uh, the slaughter of animals. And it's time to, when we get a Democratic president, God willing, after the next election. Uh, a Democratic Congress, it's going to be time in there to get a bill through Congress to put the food industry back under government regulation again. Thank you. Tip went off for smoke. Oh, Thanks, Josh. Uh, one of my favorite movies is by Frank Capra, the famous director, uh, in 1938 called You Can't Take It With You, uh, starring James Stewart and Gene Arthur. So I just want to read a transcript from the 49th minute, 50th minute, and 51st, which uh, sort of relates to this topic. So uh, Gene Arthur plays Alice, and uh, Jimmy Stewart plays Tony, and they're sitting at this park bench, because they weren't going to go to the ballet, but somehow they just ended up in the park instead of going to the ballet. Uh, my guess is Frank was trying to make a comment about how uh, they'd hoped to afford to go to the ballet, but they couldn't. Uh, so Alice goes, well, Mr. Moody, what are you thinking about? And uh, Tony goes, me? That family of yours, wow, they knocked me for a loop. I don't know. It just seems like in their own way they found what everybody is looking for. People spend their whole lives building castles in the air and then nothing ever comes of them. I wonder why that is. Well, it takes courage. Everybody's afraid to live. And Alice says, you ought to hear what Grandpa on that subject. You know, he says most people nowadays are run by fear. Fear of what they eat, fear of what they drink, fear of their jobs, their future, fear of their health. They're scared to save money and scared to spend it. You know what his pet aversion is? The people who commercialize on fear, you know. They scare us to death so they can sell us something we don't need. Yeah, well I agree with him. So he and Grandma kind of taught all of us not to be afraid of anything and to do what we want to do. And well, it's kind of fun anyway. Yeah, well, that's it. But that takes that courage, especially that do what you want to do department. I love that film because it says so much about uh, how we can have solidarity for free. 
Solidarity doesn't cost nothing. When you have solidarity, you do feel like a true millionaire, a true billionaire, a true trillionaire, because when you have solidarity, you can pull your resources together, and it doesn't matter what your opposition is from the ruling class of wealth, power, and influence. Uh, is nutritional food a human right? I think it is. I think nutritional food is just as important as oxygen, as gravity, as sunlight, as freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion. Uh, nutritional food should not be for the rich, should not be for the privileged, should not be for the few with status. Nutritional food should be for everybody and there's a glowing, growing global movement for everyone to have three nutritional meals a day. Now, uh, that might sound outrageous to the people who own these companies, the financiers, the overseers, uh, the folks who think they invented uh, vegetables and fruit and rice and beans and noodles and chicken and fish and so on and so on. But to working class families, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one thing that uh, I'm so happy that Josh talked about this evening is when you raise your kids to have healthy food, uh, their memory is better, they actually like and really like going to school. I know it would be an exaggeration to say that kids will ever love going to school, but they like and really like going to school because when they're learning from their uh, teacher and their class, uh, their mind works without any distractions. Their minds work without any complications. Their minds work in the way it's naturally supposed to happen for human beings when we evolve. Um, thank you so much, Josh. I hope you come again soon. Uh, this talk is at the center of all the other uh, talks that I've appreciated over the years because we definitely are what we eat. Are there uh, any more speakers tonight? All right, our speaker gets the last word, and we'll adjourn a little bit early tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me out today and for all your uh, thoughtful questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, ultimately, you know, if we work together, I, I truly believe that we can make significant changes that will impact the lives of millions of animals. And what that means for each of us individually is different, um, but I hope this talk today gave you some insight into some of the work we're doing and some of the areas that we focus on. Um, and I hope you can come away with this with some optimism that we're going to be able to fix this problem, um, and also that um, you're able to think um, more deeply about um, the animals that we raise for food. Um, and so I hope that you guys uh, all got some good stuff from this, and I really enjoyed uh, being here with you tonight. Take the salt, shake your gavel, the salt. You want the salt? Gavel, the salt. Oh, yeah. College adjourned. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>